In 2013, is there a rule book for how politicians should behave? And when citizens witness bad behavior in some politicians, does that decrease their trust in all of them? Joining us now to help answer that, Peter Lowen. He's a professor of political science at UTM, the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Alison Lote, executive director and co-founder of Samara. Royce and James, city affairs columnist at the Toronto Star. And Dave Meslin, co-author of Local Motion, The Art of Civic Engagement in Toronto. And we welcome you four back to our table here at TVO. Nice to have you all here. Okay, you brought this in, and this is very cute. Because uh, this may seem like a relatively recent phenomenon, all this bad behavior and so on. But apparently in 1921, people cared enough about this to write out rules of engagement. And you've got them in front of you. What is that? Yeah, I dug this up in the Toronto Archives last year. It's, um, it's a proposed set of rules for both citizens and for politicians. And uh, I don't know if they were uh, obeyed at the time, but it was something that was put forward. I'll, I'll, I'll mention some of them from the, uh, the politician's code of conduct. I will not speak on any subject unless I know something about it. Okay, stop right there. <laughs> people, it's a good are, idea. people are writing their own punchlines right now already, though. <laughs> for sure. You can't speak on a subject about which you know nothing. Yes, that would reduce a lot of the dialogue at City Hall, <laughs> for better your, or worse. There's your punchline right there. Okay. Uh, well, here's a great one, too. And when I have said all that I have to say on the value of any subject, I will stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> How often does that happen in your experience? Um, well, they have a five, they're allowed to speak for five minutes, and, and then they can Hall. do a motion for extension, and they often do. They often do. So I think they probably could have said it all at that point. Okay. They yeah. like hearing their own voice. Allison, you got something there that uh, tickles your fancy in terms of how to be a good politician back in the day? Well, I love number one as well, so that was probably my favorite <laughs> one. Um, there's some very nice ones. There's ones about how you treat the funds of the city as a trust fund. I think that's a nice concept. Mm -hmm. Do we think long term in politics? Uh, what are the, many of the challenges we do face are long term and the electoral cycles are short term. So imagine if we thought of taxpayer money as, as a trust fund for the future of the country rather than something to be expended uh, quickly. That nice might be idea. a nice change. Peter, how about you? Uh, I like the most technical one, which is 11. Uh, I will not vote to upset the recommendation of any department head until such department head has been given every opportunity to defend his recommendation and, in my judgment, has failed to do so satisfactorily. Now, that seems very civilized, doesn't it? And it seems very parliamentary. Yeah. And how often yeah. do you see that happen? Uh, I think you see deputy ministers thrown over the, over the side of the boat pretty often <laughs> these days. Yeah. Okay. Royson? I right, like number 10. I will speak and vote this year at the risk of its being my last year on council. And what's the, what, what do you infer from that? That means that you want people with backbone. I mean, you know, and we, we rarely get that. Um, people vote according to their, their, uh, the issues of their constituents uh, rather than what needs to be done. And transit is a perfect example. Uh, you know, I interpreted that a somewhat different way, which is I will speak as if it's my last year on council before I have to go back to the voters for re-election, in which case I'm going to say nothing because it'll all have to be pablum in order to get re-elected. Hmm, interesting. And it's a different yeah, interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, George Washington apparently was a very young man when he wrote out a list of 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. Is there such a rule book today and if there isn't, do we need one? David. It's hard to say. I think there's a balance between being um, acting respectably in parliament or council and being human. And there's been a lot of talk that I think some people are attracted to the fact that Rob Ford, for example, leads to the, more to the human side. I think you go too far to either extreme and you're going to alienate someone. I think it's a very fine balance and it'll be a mistake for us to assume that we need them to be uh, on one extreme or the other. It's, uh, I think it's a delicate ballet. A delicate ballet? Yeah, as all ballets are or should be. <laughs> That's the way of putting it. Alison, what do you think? Do we, need, do we have, in fact, set out rules of conduct? You can do this, you can't do this. Well, in Parliament, there is a book that outlines the rules, um, roughly speaking, which MPs are encouraged to read, but from which uh, I understand from a series of exit interviews I've done with former MPs, not many do. Uh, so I think, but that doesn't change the fact that, like Dave said, a lot of stuff does evolve and there's conventions associated that may not always be written down and it may not always be desirable to write them down. Um, but the risk sometimes of that is that people don't actually understand the rules. Really good example that came um, up in the exit interviews we did is what does an MP do when he or she disagrees with a vote on the floor of the House of Commons? Um, do they vote with their constituents? Whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Do they vote with their party? Um, if they decide that they can't vote for it for whatever reason, how do they properly abstain? Do they not show up for the vote? Um, do they abstain? 
I mean, did they come up with some other business that they had to do? So there's, the, all of them disagree about what the appropriate way to disagree is. So that's just an example that when you sort of see sometimes chaos emerging, mm -hmm. um, there is no clarity. It, that's just one example about how you actually go about disagreeing with your party or your leader. Is there actually a right answer to that question you just asked? I don't think there is, and this is where the human judgment comes in. And you know, ultimately, politics is uh, a bunch of citizens who are very much like us most of the time. Um, who have to make judgments on all of our behalves with the best information that they have available. And it's not very easy. Uh, and and it, isn't, it isn't always clear what trumps in any decision. So often, at least in federal politics, you default to just doing what your party tells you. Um, although M MPs tell us they're highly uncomfortable with that situation. We know, Royson, in the federal parliament, or in the provincial parliament as well for that matter, uh, you can't call somebody a liar. There are rules of conduct on the floor. You can't impugn their integrity. The speaker will call you out for that. Do they have that at City Hall, as far as you know? Yeah, pretty much the same. Um, you know, the rules of engagement at City Hall have been developed over a, a number of years. And I think most of the councillors, after you've been there for a year, you pretty much know the rules. And, you know, yeah, you can heckle, you know, you can call people names, et cetera. But at, at the end of the day, if the speaker calls you on it, you know, you quickly apologize. Can I ask you, for instance? Yes. Uh, not too long ago, the still mayor of Toronto, current mayor of Toronto, even though he's been somewhat defrocked. Uh, did a pantomime of somebody drunk driving in order to insult another councillor who was speaking and who had been pulled over for, in fact, drunk driving? And I'm not going to recreate it here. Everybody who saw it on YouTube or live knows what it looks like. Is that okay? It's borderline. Right? I, I think it, it, it created such a stir and a buzz because the mayor himself been drinking and driving. Right? So here he was pantomiming against another councillor when he himself has been accused of doing the very same thing. And it, plus, when you're the mayor, there, there's a certain behavior that's expected of you. You're supposed to set example. So if he is doing that, then that means all the other councillors can do similar actions. What did you think when you saw the mayor do that? Was that crossing any lines of good behavior? I think, I mean, obviously, he was making light of, of drunk driving in some ways and making light of, uh, 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 as Royson said, behavior that he himself had, in, had engaged in. But it's all a bit like sledging in cricket or, or, or chirping, that you can, you can do it and you can do it and you can do it until you get caught. And when you get caught, the penalties can be pretty severe and for good reason. But the things that you don't hear are pretty nasty, I think, sometimes. Uh, for instance? I mean, among politicians or yeah. among cricketers? <laughs> cricketers I'm not asking about. But, but are, there, are there some things that in your travels that you've heard either on the floor of parliament or on the floor of a city council muttered under their breath, maybe away from the microphones, but that they get away with? Well, I think if you take the example of, do you remember when Peter McKay referred to, to Belinda Stronick as a dog? Right. In response to actually quite harsh heckling on the, yeah. other, on the other side. They'd just broken up. We should just set the scene there. They, mm -hmm. she, she dumped him. <laughs> She had, um, uh, uh, but that was something that was caught. But I think that kind of that kind of exchange happens actually with some with some regularity, especially when when the commons is really when the temperature is really high in the uh, in the commons. And I'm sure, Royston has examples of pretty nasty exchanges that go on at, at City Hall, but go but go unnoticed. So it it's a lot like the sports field, I think, or like the like the ice, where a lot of things are said in the corners that aren't picked up until. Hockey Night in Canada has the mics on, and then people are pretty shocked by what's said. <laughs> but it happens all the time. It really does. In your exit interviews, did you hear about this kind of thing? Not so much there, but we published a piece probably about two years ago from a woman who had analyzed all the heckles in the House of Commons, so that don't always appear in the public record. And she found that there were a significant number of them that were uh, sexist, racist, uh, things that are frankly against the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, you know, it wasn't all of them, obviously, but there was a significant proportion of them. And, uh, and so her point, of course, is that, you know, we wouldn't permit that sort of language or bullying in most workplaces, and, but yet we seem to allow it to uh, happen I'm, in our legislature. I'm not asking this facetiously, but I, ha I do recall, I think Justin Trudeau looked across the floor at Peter Kent, then a cabinet minister, and said he was full of shit. Are you allowed to say that? In I'm not sure I'm allowed to say it on TV, but <laughs> we'll I just out. did. Can you say that in Parliament? Uh, well, he did say it, so one can say it. Um, but there is sort of a bigger point here, which is why do politicians who we ostensibly elect to uphold their profession um, continue to act in ways that pull themselves all down? And there are some reasons for this, and I imagine we'll all get into them. We will. Um, but that's one of the interesting sh things to me I always think about when I see this behavior. Dave? I think there should be a distinction between comments that are homophobic, racist, sexist, etc., 
and comments that seem to be using language that we don't think is acceptable. I think that should be up to voters. And even liar. I don't know. There's been times at council where I kind of wished half a council had stood up and called someone a liar on any you know, certain issue. Um, uh, or saying you're full of whatever. I mean, that's how we speak. You know, when these cameras go off and we're chatting, our language will be different. Well, maybe not yours. You've, you've crossed a line. Speak for yourself. <laughs> say, yeah. But we all speak more loosely with our friends and at home. And again, to go back to Rob Ford, part of the appeal to him is that he doesn't care about those norms. And again, we don't want to go all the way to not having any etiquette at council. But there is something about acknowledging that we're human. And why do we pretend that we're not? Let's get Royce and Peter. A council meeting is a formal, a formal affair. I mean, it's not two boys and two girls or a bunch of us sitting around drinking and, and using street language. It's Maybe it's too formal. It's, Maybe that's one of the things pushing people away from politics. You, wait a sec. You think that's city possible. council is too formal? <laughs> Did I hear you say that? Well, the, the highlights you see on the news is just one small part of it. If you actually try and sit through an, an entire day, yeah, it's incredibly formal and incredibly boring. Hmm. And if we want to attract people to politics, having looser language and make it seem like more of an actual dialogue of people sitting in a bar might, might make it more accessible. So everyone's enjoying city council these days, I'm sure. There's, right? more, people in the, there's more people in the yeah. audience. Yeah. That's for, you know, way more people. The, that for, chamber's been empty for years. For the, uh, people are coming more, and watching. More people there for the right reason today? It's debatable. It's debatable. Uh, okay. Peter? If I, I don't want to pick on Mr. Trudeau, but if I could just point out one thing. He didn't actually say that Peter Kent was full of it. He said that he was it. And there's an important distinction there, right, between saying that a person's lying or a person saying something that's untrue and saying that a person is a piece of excrement. And I think that it reflects how far Parliament, how far sort of fellow feeling in, in, in Parliament has fallen. That, I, that's an interesting distinction. I had not made that. Yeah. to be clear, the Speaker yeah. made it very apparent that it was an appropriate language. And yeah. Justin Trudeau re apologized unreservedly huh. to his credit. Okay. Let's, I got something here I want to, I want to read. This is uh, Andrew Coyne who wrote this in that, sorry about this. It's terrible to have somebody from the Star here and read from the National Post, but okay. Here's Andrew Coyne on what's been going on at Trin Toronto City Hall these days. Watching the mayor and his brother strutting about the council chamber, ignoring the speaker, taunting other councillors, shouting down city officials, screaming insults at spectators, the whole carried out with an air of anarchic glee was to sense the last tether connecting our politics to some sort of civilized norms breaking under the strain. We are adrift now, floating wildly with no idea of where we will end, the rest of us are, in a sense, handcuffed. We simply don't know how to respond to this level of misconduct, this sort of contempt for social norms. At some level, our whole system depends upon people, however badly they may behave, staying within some sorts of limits. Absolutely. We agree. Absolutely. If you were in the council chamber that day, I mean, you would... The, the behavior was just unbelievably bad. I think for the first time in about 10, 15 years, I actually said something out loud in the council chamber. Because the, the speaker was telling the media to go back to their seats, not to try to follow the mayor as he went around you know, inciting the public. I mean, and I said, well, you keep the mayor in his seat, and we'll stay in ours. You said I mean, that it, to the speaker? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It got to the point. It, it was really bad. You're but, out of order. <laughs> I, I was out of you order, were. but so was the mayor. So was the entire council. So, you know, if that's how we want to attract people to the council chamber, then I'm sorry, shut it down. Dave? Really. Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, it's that ballet I was talking about. Uh, obviously, that day got out of hand. I wasn't there. Um, there is heckling all the time, and it goes, it's not just coming from Rob Ford, it's going all around. I would say any. Sorry, from the audience, there's heckling? No, counselors to each other. Okay. Um, Rob Ford, you probably agree, is actually probably the most, at this point, we see him as the bully because he's in a position of power and he feels under attack and he's fighting back. But for 10 years as a councillor, he was probably the most mocked member of council. Uh, he would stand up, everyone would laugh, and they would vote 44 to 1. A lot of us forget that because uh, it's obviously a very different situation now. Um, I, I think when they mock each other in a way that, that is childish, like a schoolyard mocking, that lowers the level. Of debate for sure. Allison, are we entitled but, but as... We, don't, we never allow the, the audience to clap. You know, I think having allowing clapping in the chamber would be great. What's wrong with that? They don't allow that, do no, they? No, you start clapping and the speaker says, I'm going to ask everyone to leave if you continue to express yourselves as citizens. Let me follow up on that. Is it about, I mean, you see that at Queen's Park uh, all the time where there, there may be demonstrators in the, in the public galleries and if they boo or if they clap, the speaker shuts it down right away. Is that... 
in this 21st century still, is it still inappropriate to express some emotion from the galleries? Um, I don't think it's inappropriate at all. I think it's, it's wonderful. And one of the sort of strange things, and Dave and, and Royce and I've talked about City Hall, but it's the same with Parliament. I mean, how many people places make good decisions by having 308 people sitting in a room ostensibly talking back and forth. I mean, it's a, it's a very archaic, in a way, way to make a decision for a sort of modern, complex democracy. Um, so, you know, what does a redesigned parliament look like? Who knows? I mean, there's lots of proposals for that. Um, but the, you know, if you ever try to go to question period, I mean, you have to pass through two security um, uh, scanners like airport yep. scanners. Um, you have to give your all your bags and your phone and everything away, so you can't contribute even digitally. Um, it feels very outdated and not modern and not at all participatory or engaging to the not public. Not welcoming at all, is it? No, it was. It was the last time I went. I thought I mean, it took me an hour to even be able to enter, and it was uh, not not enjoyable at all. Hmm. I know I have been at Queens Park, Peter, at times where they're screaming at each other on the floor. And then something will happen, a disturbance will happen up in the public galleries. And the floor will get all quiet, and they'll be mortified that people up there are behaving as badly as the people on the floor. Somehow, they seem to think it's okay for them to behave badly, but God forbid it happens up in the galleries. Do, do they not get how odd that sounds? I mean, I'm not sure it sounds odd to me, actually. I mean, we've kind of elected these folks to be the ones who yell at each other so we don't have to. And I, and I, mean, that, I mean that kind of, I actually mean it sincerely in, in a sense that We've elected people to spend a lot of time being deeply engaged in issues, thinking hard about them, fighting fiercely over them, trying to find political advantage. And the theory is that this should make us better off than people making technical, bureaucratic decisions in a windowless office somewhere, in a way away from the public gaze. So politics is ugly, for sure, and it certainly descends to the level of unacceptable acrimony with far too much frequency now. But we've got to recognize that at its core, it's about settling disagreements politically rather than settling them in other ways. I think that's a fundamental part of politics. So it engenders conflict and it engenders debate and it engenders disagreement. That Those things are all naturally nasty and it's hard to disagree respectfully all the time. The problem right now, obviously, is that disagreement is happening disrespectfully more often than it ha happens respectfully. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and, and an incivility is following along with that. We can disagree with each other. Um, in, a, in, a, in a very civil way, even in a vigorous way, and in a way that has a lot of the contours of debate. So, in short, I, I, I don't think it's a, uh, I don't think it's terrible that politicians yell at each other, maybe even heckle. I think citizens should comport themselves maybe differently, but uh, uh, the level's fallen too far. Well, they do, Allison, call it the House of Commons, meaning it is a place for common people to gather. So is it reasonable for us to expect a higher level of behavior from common people, as it were. I mean, my view is it is. I mean, we um, probably long ago, and maybe it never existed, a time where we uh, saw elected leaders as role models. Um, and interestingly, some work we've done uh, in the community with young people, where we're trying to encourage people to how to and teach them how to get politically engaged. One of the most common comments they make is, "I don't even know what a positive sort of political engagement would look like because I don't see much evidence of it in the news or on TV or around the table." So I think we sort of have lost this concept of of a role model uh, as a politician, and, and maybe it's outdated, and maybe it never ever existed. But I would personally love if if our elected leaders sort of saw themselves that way. Um, and conducted themselves accordingly, we might see higher quality decisions too. Do you think politicians ought to be role models to people across the country? Uh, the people who talk to me think so. I mean, you know, my, I go to the neighborhood variety store and the Korean guy, he says, Mr. James, if this guy, he's talking about the mayor, if he can get away with doing this, what do I tell my kids? You know, you, I try to tell them you obey the law and you be a good citizen. Well, if the mayor's doing it and he gets away with it, I don't know what to tell my kids. You find that persuasive? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a, another woman at my church. Her kid is, what, six, seven years old? And she's speaking to her sister. She says, did you hear what the mayor did? Sister says, no, I didn't. And the six-year-old says, I know. The mayor is be being a bad, a bad boy. So the, the kids expect it. I um, mean, yeah, you know, at least in my circles they do. Um, they expect their political leaders to be role models. They expect different behavior. Yeah, you're all common people, 
but we elect you and put you in a position of responsibility and authority. And therefore and we such, expect more. Absolutely. And are we entitled to more? Yeah, but there's, there's, there's different things we should be expecting and asking for. And I think uh, I'm going to be the, the devil's advocate a bit, if that's okay today. I think Rob Ford actually embodies some of the things we should be asking for. I mean, we keep focusing on the, the drugs and the drinking and this and that. You know, that's not what he was elected for. He was elected for genuine characteristics that I think his opponents could learn from. He's very passionate. You know, one of the politicians who got me inspired in, into politics was Jack Layden. Not when he was an MP, when he was a counselor before he was being teleprompted. 30 years ago. He used to pound his fist on the desk and, and yell. I mean, he got really, really excited, belly of fire. And, um, you know, Rob Fork, I think, comes across to his supporters as being incredibly passionate about the things he believes in, the gravy train and this and that. And the whole thing about, you know, call me, call me on my phone. It's kind of mm -hmm. silly. That's not why we elect a mayor to do constituency work. On the other hand, what a great model for the idea that politicians should be accessible. You know, here's my cell number, Toronto, three million people, call me. I expect that. I don't expect that from a mayor, but that, that idea that my office is accessible to you, not, I don't just want your vote once every four years, I want to hear from you constantly. I like that. Hmm. We put out a little piece of research this morning where we looked at MPs' websites as a sort of proxy for how they are engaging with the public. Hmm. And, you know, 98% of them have their bios and they have, here's my office, only a few of them actually have their office hours listed on their website. Um, and then you look at the sort of far end, do they actually use the web um, to ask for feedback, to ha survey constituents, to get regular commentary, to even ask for their advice, to encourage them to volunteer. Mm -hmm. Only 5% ask them, tell them how to volunteer. Huh. Only 11% actually actively solicit feedback on anything. So that's just another proxy for the same thing Dave mm -hmm. mentions, which is that politics doesn't send this message, uh, at least if you look at MPs' websites as, a, as an example for that, but they're actually at all interested in hearing from people, where I think Rob Ford, to your point, Dave, really, really did do, you do know, that. Do you know whether when they actually solicit opinions and people take the trouble to email in their views on a particular thing, do they actually read that stuff? Do they actually ingest that stuff? So when we did the exit interviews, we asked the MPs how they went about gauging their constituents' views, because MPs and probably all politicians evoke their constituents as rationale for their decisions. But I often think, you know, I live in downtown Toronto, what is a constituent of my riding? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, and the truth is there are very um, informal and rudimentary techniques. Uh, one MP talked about, you know, I would plan to go to the grocery store for three hours on Saturday and just walk up and down the aisles and kind of get a gauge of public opinion. Um, I mean, it's better than nothing, uh, but, you know, it's, it's limited. It's not scientific, but it's something. Yeah, it's something. Um, but let's look at things like email newsletters where you can actually send out notes, see what people click on, see what they're interested in. Less than half of MPs actually have newsletters. Those are really great ways of just, even without asking the MP to you know, write anything, uh, they can just get a sense of what, what uh, interests at least a subset of their, of their writing. Okay. So there's lots of tools and, and ways beyond just a cell phone that, that MPs or any elected official can be engaging with the public. We have, as you uh, will no doubt not be surprised to hear, we have done a few programs on the whole City Hall business, Toronto City Hall business and the, the sort of Ford fiasco business. And, um, one of the guys who was sitting in that chair a week or so ago was named Eric Perlstein. And he was a big, you know, he's a member of Ford Nation. He's a big Ford supporter, and, and his vote for the current mayor is still there to be had for next time. He has not abandoned uh, Rob Ford in spite of it all. And here's what he had to say about the mayor's behavior. Let's check it out. Roll tape, please. Moral authority and politics have gone their separate ways and I think that happened a long time ago. There have been countless issues with political leaders. Uh, it's not my key factor in determining whether someone's going to run the city. So Royce, role model, moral authority, you know, a certain dignity in the office, that's not how he gauges his vote. And I wonder what you think that says about how we view government today. That says that there is a percentage of the populace who vote with their pocketbooks, right? Or they have a lot of other concerns. They don't care about the personal stuff. They don't care if the mayor smokes crack. Frankly, they don't care what the mayor does with his or her own personal time. As long as the garbage gets picked up on time. As long as it gets picked up on time, as long as you don't, you don't mess with my money, you know, taxes are kept low. And hey. That's fine, that's, that's what moves them, that's what motivates them, and there's a hardcore, I would say 15% of the population 
that's it. That's all they care about. All the stuff about civic engagement, the stuff that you do, the stuff that you do, they don't care about that stuff. Don't mess with my pocketbook. Keep my taxes low, and I'm happy. Is that a perfectly legitimate point of view to, to have as far as you're concerned? All points of view are leg legitimate. No, they're not. So, yes. Ten, that, that, so 10%, 10, 10 percent, that's fine. That's not the majority. That's not what rules our city. Did right? you say a bad thing? They're not all equal. Not all points of view are equal. I mean, some are actually very worthy and some are stupid. I'm trying to get a sense from you of whether that's a worthy point of view to have. For the, not for me, but that's what sends them. That's what motivates them, and that's fine. I mean, at least they go out and vote. Okay, so, so at, at least they're paying some attention. Right? I'd rather them do that and vote for their pocketbooks and at least vote rather than have no interest at all. Okay. Peter, what do you think that says about how we view government today? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's troubling in some sense, but it doesn't, you know, the, the, the gentleman you had on said that it doesn't all come just from Rob Ford. It comes from many, many years of broken promises, and I think, that, I think that's legitimate. I'd, I'd say two things about it in particular. One is that if you look at that last election, Rob Ford, essentially against George Smitherman by the end. Voters had a choice to make. And some of them chose a guy who had a personal history that was very checkered, who uh, had police calls to his house, who'd been drunk in public on several occasions. You look back then and you see the tea leaves of what you were going to get in the mayor now. And they put him up against a cabinet minister who had, by the end of his term, essentially two massive failures as a cabinet minister, which should have ended his political career. He screwed up. Uh, uh, that's the technical term, uh, uh, electrical transmission and green energy in Ontario, probably the worst international trade violation that we've seen. The federal government's fighting now this green energy Samsung deal. Terrible Sam deal. Um, and, he, and he messed up e-health. Now, you, if His it, signature if, was on orange, too. Not it to it, make it was. Well, if you want to make you yeah. know, third time's a charm. But if you want to look at records, I, I think voters in that case had a tough decision to make. And in some cases, they're going up, they're looking at one guy who's, who's a little rough around the edges, and certainly there were serious questions about his judgment and his integrity on a personal level, and put up against him was a politician with, a, in my view, an almost disqualifying record. And I'll tell you, I voted for the man despite that. You voted for? For Smitherman. Now, uh, 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 you know, you can't blame voters in that case for making the choice that they made necessarily, right? So, so you know, voters, and, and in the next election, people who oppose Rob Ford should not hope that they can just win by running an anti-Rob Ford. They're going to have to come up with someone who can actually say what they're going to do about transit, what they're going to do about taxes, and it won't just fall back on tropes about how Toronto is great and we need to get rid of this fellow from, from the suburbs or whatever phrases they use to dismiss people there. So I, I mean, I think, I think Royston is right. There's some people who are entirely concerned about their pocketbooks, some people who would, who would never vote for Rob Ford even if he was a great guy. But all the people in the middle have got to be given a candidate who has personal integrity, but also can say with a lot of information in an informed way what he or she is going to do for the city. Dave? There's something to be said about what the fellow was saying, though, in terms of the morality. Um, yes, we have to hold them up to a certain standard, and they should be role models. But one thing that turns people away from politics is the idea that if I run for office, my entire life will be under scrutiny. And I think there's some degree to which if Rob Ford smokes crack on his own time, it's none of our business. If he's drinking and driving, that affects the safety of people around him. If there's domestic issues at home, obviously that reflects on him if there's, if there's violence or this or that. But I don't know. I feel at some, at some times the media's actually gone too far. Great headline I took a picture of a few weeks ago. New evidence shows that the mayor was drunk on St. Patrick's Day. Who isn't drunk on St. Patrick's Day? I mean, a isn't actually, that kind of what the same thing? Actually, a lot of people aren't drunk on St. We sell, We celebrate and glamorize drinking. We have bars on every corner. The mayor wants to go out and get drunk as long as he doesn't drive home. Great. But he did Who cares? Drive home. This, That's yeah, the thing. Yeah. But that wasn't the headline. Yeah, that was the headline. No, but we, yeah, I think we, I think we crossed the, the line, and it's bolstering his base because we feel like uh, no, 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 we come no, no, across no, as being a no, nanny state. No, no, because the Toronto no. Star did not, uh, just respectfully, yeah. the Toronto Star did not run a story saying, this councillor was also drunk on St. Patrick's Day, and this councillor had too much to drink Which on makes Christmas Eve. it look Eve. like we're bullying him. No. Exactly. That's my point. Why he's, not? Because he's being bullied because there's very credible evidence that he snorted cocaine in public on that evening, that he drove home after being brought home in a taxi. None of those were the headlines. Home. Well, it's a it's I a, think we have to be careful headline. how we're framing this. Okay. You know, the reason, and for, I the, think the reason for the headline was that the mayor and the mayor's um, advisors, they all denied that that happened. And when the story first ran back in March, right, they said, no way that didn't happen. The star is lying. You guys are pathological liars. And they went to great extent to say this isn't true. 
So the headline is just playing on that, that when the reports came out in the, in the police reports, it proves that, yes, you were What about the rant? Drunk. I mean, that rant was in a private home. I, it makes me not want to. What are you referring to? He now? Was good, he, when he's, he's going to rip his, I'm going to rip his throat oh, out, and I need right. ten minutes to rip out his throat. I don't want to run for office. I mean, I, I do rants all the time about ripping people's throats out when I'm at home. It's no, my home. Like Dave, I go on crazy. No, you don't. Well, maybe not the ripping. All due respect, throat. you don't. But I get I when I talk politics with my partner, I get angry. I talk about my day, and I get angry about people I might have interacted with and what's happening at City Hall in a tone that I wouldn't necessarily do right now. And I don't wouldn't want to run for office thinking that if someone shot a videotape of me in a private home and the media got it, that they'd run it. You, I think there's a line. It's a fine line. I don't know what it is. I take your point, but you've never been in your life as angry as he was and out of control as he I was. Walls. I don't know if I've done the throat ripping out thing, but um, come on, we've all gone on rants at home and we're angry about something, right? Am I alone here? <laughs> it's yeah. You seem to be so far, but maybe that's just because you're the most honest one so far. <laughs> does could be this, it. No, but there you go. Does this, does all of this though make us, you know, there, there is a sense that, um, at least people tell me this, they're all like this. Yes, we're finding it out about Rob Ford, but they all behave badly and we can't, we have no reason to expect that any of them can, can perform their duties with any semblance of respectability now. That's what, I mean, you're hearing this, right? A pox on all their houses. Don't you hear that? Yeah, I, I, I heard in that, that? in that commentator's uh, observation a much deeper point, which is essentially that when he said this, that politicians have ceded moral authority. And that's a blanket statement, and there's, you know, 90% of them actually probably haven't. Um, but we do tend to focus on that 10%. And this goes back for a long time. I mean, if you just sort of look at what are the indicators of, of Canadians' views towards politics, I mean, voter turnout, let's just take that. We've seen, um, Peter, we have an expert at our table here, but something like 30 plus years of declining voter turnout driven largely by young people who've never, who never ever start voting again. Um, who are not disengaged on issues, just on process. Uh, yes, and who don't see themselves in their elected leaders. Yeah. And you, at least that's what they cite as one reason why they don't vote, and there's other you know, reasons, and this goes beyond just Canada. Um, and so I, I do think there is a wider point, and this, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, we, at least I feel like I elect uh, my leaders at all government, all levels of government, to uphold the standards of, of our political process and, the, and that public decision-making process that I view as important. And when they act in ways that uh, call that into question, I don't think it does anybody a service, and I, I think it leads to a very rational reaction, which we heard earlier today. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's Alan Gregg. I'm going to read a little bit of this. Alan, of course, uh, hosted a program here on TVO for many, many years, and he had the following to say uh, in a paper called On Authenticity, How the Truth Can Restore Faith in Politics and Government. Here we go. The public refuses to extend the benefit of the doubt to our leaders and instead consistently holds the whole to account for the sins of the few. And the cause of this, I think, is equally straightforward. Even if reason might indicate that bad behavior is the work of the few, citizens no longer believe that their leaders speak the truth. Therefore, the defense is not credible because the defenders are not credible. For whatever else our leaders' shortcomings, this strikes me as their most systematic failure. They have not picked up on the electorate's craving for authenticity, nor adjusted their behavior to conform to this new reality. Uh, Peter, this craving for authenticity, I mean, this is part of, I guess, what the mayor of Toronto is banking on. He is nothing if not himself, right? Yeah, I think there's two things there with, with, with the authenticity idea. The one is that you want people to, to be frank with you and to be truthful even when the truth hurts. And you also want them to be, their, be themselves. Uh, it's to the mayor's great, this is Andrew Potter's point actually, it's to, it's to the mayor's great detriment that, that if he believes people want him to be authentic, he thinks they want him to be authentic in, in all the ways that he is, authentically out of control, authentically an ability to curb his appetite uh, of all sorts. Um, that's not what people want in some sense. I think they want leaders who are very clear about what they're going to do and tell people how you know, the pie is going to be cut up and why it's going to be cut up that way. They don't only want them to be uh, indulgent and drunk and, and uh, uh, in a stupor, uh, so to speak. So I think, I think voters want an authentic person, and Rob Ford is one in some sense. He goes to a football game, he has a nice time, and he tells people what he's going to do, and he seems to be sincere about it. Those are all good things. His inability to control himself are bad things. So, you know, if, if you compare him, for example, with someone like Nahid Nenshi, who's a politician who appears to be a real straight talker. Mayor and, of Calgary. Mayor of Calgary, and say what he's going to do, and, and is rewarded for that, you can see that, you know, authenticity and approach and truth-telling and what you're going to do 
can win you elections without being, you know, an out of out of control on a personal on a personal level. But let me pick up on that with Royson. The the, the vices that you've just talked about become virtues in Ford Nation because they're all part of his, his authenticity. I mean, that's a bit problematic, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's part of his brand, and you're right. And um, I, I think somebody earlier said that if, if you think you're going to defeat this guy um, running on, on a campaign that's saying, well, his vices are so terrible that we should get rid of him, that's, that's not going to work because people have already discounted that. They, they expect it off him. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is, is that type of authenticity a virtue? I, I don't think so. Uh, I would think people want to be told the real goods. I mean, I, I use transit as a perfect example. You know, we, I think we, we need, for instance, a leader who will tell us to fix the transit problem in the, in, in the greater Toronto area is going to cost us X number of dollars. You know what it means? Your taxes are going to have to go up. It means we may have to pay tolls. We may have to do this, this, and that, uh, rather than trying to sugarcoat it and saying, okay, well, you know, well, the private sector, they'll come in and, and pay for this, or somebody else will pick it up, and you can get this, this wonderful, great city without paying for it. That's the type of double talk that, that people don't want. They want to hear the real goods. Now, Ford is authentic in the sense that he, he's out there, right? He's, he's himself. Yeah, but at the same time, um, he's not authentic in, in the messages he gives the people as to how they'll actually get this city, this great city that we all love, because he'll, he'll, he gives the impression that you can get it for free. Well, does that authenticity look like it has any currency with you? Now, can, can he go out and spend that authenticity in, in the support of stuff he believes in? I mean, he may be able to. I have a slightly different view on, I think, while he was so electorally successful. And I think it's because he spoke to citizens' frustration with the quality of services they receive from government. Mm -hmm. So for all, you know, we've spoke about wonderful debates and, and, uh, and discussions that we're having in our chambers. We also remember most people interact with government when they need a service or need help with something. Uh, we did some research about two years ago with, with Canadians who don't vote. And one of the biggest reasons why they said they don't vote is because they have tried to get some assistance or redress or something from a government and they don't distinguish the levels mm -hmm. in the past and have been treated terribly. And so they say, you know, there's a great quote, politics doesn't care about me, why should I care about it? And I think Rob Ford, you know, through being accessible through his phone calls, through going to your house, and um, I think he tapped that frustration, and it, which is, I think, a really important point all uh, politicians should should focus on. Uh, he tapped that really effectively. So I don't know if that makes him authentic or not authentic, but I think he spoke to a legitimate grievance a lot of people have about their governments. Can he take that currency out and spend it, Dave? We'll find out, I guess. Um, uh, I mean, his campaign actually was a lot like David Miller's campaign in a way. I mean, on one hand, they're polar opposites. Yeah. On the other hand, Miller held up a broom and said, you're going to sweep out the elite. Mm -hmm. And Rob Ford ran out a campaign of sweeping out the elite. And one was a political elite, one's a corporate economic elite. But in a way, they were appealing to the same voters, I think, in a lot of ways. But there's no doubt he's authentic. I mean, watching him for 10, 15 years, his message has been incredibly consistent. consistent. I wish the debate was shifting more towards what Royson was talking about. You know, what really bothers me is when he's disingenuous about the facts, about taxation, about revenue, about revenue tools and spending. Um, the rest of it, I, almost at this point, feels like a distraction because every time we're talking about whether or not he smokes crack, we're not talking about how his mathematics is fantasy hmm. when yeah. it comes to the budget. Yeah, I, I think no one is voting for Rob Ford because he smokes crack, to be clear, right? It's not that there's, any, there's a great demand in Etobicoke and Scarborough for an alcoholic, drug-addicted <coughs> mayor. I think what's going on is that, with, with, with all due respect to the star, which, has been a, which, which deserves a lot of kudos for the persistence, it's pursued this, the persistence with which it's pursued the story, Rob Ford was, has been picked on for a long time, and Dave is right. He's been picked on in council for a long time, and I think that when he got elected, and you heard people saying things like, well, Toronto didn't vote for Rob Ford, the suburbs voted for Rob Ford. And there was a good bit of snobbery involved in all of it, really, from all quarters. And I think what that told people who voted for him, 20% of people in Trinity Spadina voted for him, by the way, but what it told people in the suburbs who voted for him was, you, you're not like us downtown. Mm -hmm. So they're going to look at Rob Ford and they're going to say, you know what, maybe he drinks too much, maybe he smokes crack, does it on his own time. But he's for but that's, me. that's his business, yeah. right? And they're just picking on him like they've always picked on him. And you know what? It's, I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, people who knew his character could see this stuff coming. But for people who couldn't, they just saw a lot of this as bullying and a lot of it as, as 
downtown <laughs> looking down on the quote-unquote suburbs. And it's no wonder then that they tune out when people say, you know, Rob Ford is not telling you the truth or he's not giving you the straight goods or he's not good at math, which he's not good at. But, but I, I think it's reasonable people tune mm -hmm. this out. And he'll, he has a lot of currency from that and he'll spend it, uh, spend that and more, I'm sure, in the next election. The currency I'm thinking of, though, is this is a policy I want. I'm spending my currency, which I have acquired by being my authentic self. Therefore, I can win a vote at council. I don't see that kind of currency out Not there. For one year, he had that. He did for one year. One right. year. The first he year. He hasn't had it for a while now. Right. Although right. if he wins next year, um, yeah, what it'll be interesting. Sure. I mean, he'll have to. What the, the, the council will have back. to give his uh, <laughs> mayoralty powers back yeah. and his mm -hmm. office. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I want to just move our discussion for a second now to the provincial level. Uh, in this quest for authenticity that the voters you've told us uh, are on, the Liberal government of Ontario, my spidey senses tells me, tell me, should be 15 points behind the Conservative Party right now. I mean, w when you've had these many barnacles attached to the body, uh, the opposition party ought to be 15 points ahead. And they're not. They're basically tied. It's basically a third, a third, a third right now. Uh, margin of error being what it is. Let's go around on this. What does that say about the level of authenticity of the party leaders at Queen's Park today? You get to go first. I always struggle with what authenticity means um, because I think it is very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, is it so, so I, I'm, I've I've never really sort of understood when that's applied to politicians exactly what we're talking about. Um, so in terms of Queen's Park specifically, um, it, it probably does speak to a certain personal popularity that the Premier has that is showing up in some polls, at least I've seen, um, that may, uh, you know, much like we're willing to perhaps forgive some of Rob for, some people are willing to forgive Rob for his private behavior, as, as Dave talked about. Um, perhaps we are uh, willing to forgive some of the transgressions of the previous Liberal government that people don't see as being um, the Premier's fault. Um, but I, I don't know that's purely speculative. I would... I would Look to those who. Go ahead, Royston. What do you think on that? Well, you know, it's latent support for, for the Liberals, so you, you're going to have a base of support, anyways, right? One. And number two, you got Kathleen Wynne, who is new. Yes, you know, it's the same party, but um, let's, you know, let's cut her some slack, right? For, for at least for a year or so, see how she, she makes out. So that, that, that's two. And I think that's the, and then the third, the third uh, point is Tim Hudak. The alternative, he really hasn't caught fire. I, I think there's a sense that in the, in the electorate that they're not they're not too sure about this guy. What 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 does he really stand for? Um, does he have a, um, a policies that actually speak to the to the people, or is he just attacking 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 the liberals on the same points that we've all heard over and over again? So it'll be fascinating fascinating to see how this plays out over the next six months, a year. But as of now. Um, they, there's a latent support for the Liberals, and the alternative really hasn't caught fire. What, do, what does the competitive nature of the polling at Queen's Park today tell you about voters' feelings about the authenticity of the various leaders? Well, I, I think a lot of what Allison said is correct, that, that, that Kathleen Wynne is, a, is, is attractive as a, as a new person, and she's a breath of fresh air. And I thought that her, remember her speech at the convention, at the Liberal convention, it was instructive for a couple of reasons. One was she flubbed her last line, and she said, I'm going to do it again. I'm just, and you know, that, was, that was very endearing. But the main thing was, there had been whispers in that campaign. And the whispers were, you're all good liberals, and of course, you wouldn't be biased against a lesbian. But you know other Ontarians are. So don't elect this person. And she addressed it straight on. And she addressed it essentially by saying that she had faith that Ontarians would judge her, not on, the, you know, not on her sexual orientation, but on the things she does in office. And I think that that was a really compelling message. I think it says a lot about her sort of trust in the judgment of voters. And I think voters like people who presume that they have some sense, right? That they can make good decisions. And that if you're straight with them, uh, so to speak, they'll make uh, the right choices. What does the Progressive Conservative Party being in the low to mid 30s tell you about what people think of their leader? Uh, I'm puzzled by Hudak's positions in the polls. And I have a hard time. I have a hard time sorting it out. I think he's been plodding along, doing the good work of an opposition leader. But I think it's worth considering the position Stephen Harper was in 05 going into that campaign, which eventually happened in 06. He didn't start that election really high up in the polls, but he'd done all the slow plotting work you do 
to plan an election and uh, the seeds that he'd sown in the year since his defeat in 2004 yeah. uh, obviously reaped, uh, reaped a victory. So I wouldn't count Hudak out at this point and I think he's worked very hard. Uh, but uh, reading the current polls isn't, I think, super useful for knowing how he's going to do in the next campaign. Oh, for sure. Dave, last word on this before we move on. I'll keep it short. After the last Alberta election and BC election, I think it's wise to ignore polls. <laughs> Amen. Well That's well put. Short, succinct, nicely said. Um, here's, um, here's a political commentator who's relatively new on the scene. His name is Russell Brand. Actually, he's not a political commentator. He's a comedian, and he wrote this essay for the New Statesman um, a couple of months ago. For those who are disenchanted about the state of politics today, I'm going to read a little excerpt of it here. Uh, Russell says, I've never voted. Like most people, I am utterly disenchanted by politics. Like most people, I regard politicians as frauds and liars. And the current political system is nothing more than a bureaucratic means for furthering the augmentation and advantages of economic elites. Uh, the comedian Billy Connolly said, don't vote. It encourages them. And the desire to be a politician should bar you for life from ever being one. I don't vote. Russell says, because to me it seems like a tacit act of compliance. I know, I know my grandparents fought in two world wars and one World Cup and so that I'd have the right to vote. Well, they were conned. As far as I'm concerned, there is nothing to vote for. I feel it is a far more potent political act to completely renounce the current paradigm than to participate in even the most trivial and tokenistic manner by obediently Xing a little box. Now, he did an interview on the BBC that's got 9 million YouTube hits. 88,000 likes, 4,000 dislikes. Folks, he's tapping into something. Does that kind of thinking concern you? I, he articulated the way I think a lot of people feel. Uh, the challenge with it is that, you know, what's the alternative? Right. Um, if you look at any, I mean, I don't know a single person that is uh, apathetic about issues that are facing their community or their families, schools, hospitals, roads, you know, whatever they might be. Um, and most of the money that we expend on those areas are made by the decisions that elected leaders uh, make. And so my worry, I mean, I, I, I hear the sentiment and we all feel it sometimes probably ourselves. Um, and then, but what I, I do worry about is that just perpetuates the there's no alternative. I mean, frankly, there are many ways to express your political views besides just voting. Um, I mean, he has a great, great audience already and I'm, I'm glad he did it. There's nothing that prevents uh, people from joining groups or using social media tools, boycotting, protesting. I mean, there's lots of ways to be political besides voting. And so what I fear a bit about Mr. Brand's essay was that he didn't illuminate those options for the audience, the sizable audience that he has. Royson, what's your view on this feeling which is out there in Trolls. big time numbers, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you don't care, then you don't get the privilege of complaining. That's, that's my response to it. I mean, I, I, I deal with young people all the time and they, they zone out from a lot of stuff that's happening around them. But is it enough to say, if you don't vote, I don't need to listen to you? Yes. It is enough to say Yes, that. yes, really. I mean, this is a democracy, right? And I mean, at my church, I look around and says, look, hey, there are 300 of you right now. Whatever the old people are doing, if you took control of the church, you can run it. The service <laughs> can be the way you want it, but you have to engage. If you don't, well, okay, that's fine. That's your choice. You don't have to. But you don't get but to complain about it. You don't either. get to complain about it afterwards. Because what, what are the avenues of engagement? I'm sorry, well, somebody made the rules and the rules. Learn the rules and participate and change the process. That's, that's my response to this. Dave, how about it? I think his prescription is simple and wrong, but I think he was brilliant in the interview. But so was Paxman by saying, yeah, as you said, what's the alternative? So the answer is how do we make politics more relevant? How do we solve the issues he's raising? other than not voting. And I sense a speech about the preferential ballot coming up. Well, I mean, uh, it, could be, it could be a rank ballot. It could be proportional representation, too. In his interview, he talked about how one reason he doesn't vote is because he feels there isn't enough choice. And different voting systems would give us m more choice. The Green Party, for example, is discouraged from running because they play the Ralph Nader effect. They're, and even when they run, people are encouraged not to vote for them because you're going to waste your vote. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a political system that encourages new voices. He also has a great line in that interview where he talks about the conservative decor of parliament. 
and how it's designed in a way, aesthetically, to make people who come from an elite background comfortable. And he says something like, most people walk in and feel uncomfortable, and some people walk in and say, this is how it should be. <laughs> and you know, I was in Queens Park a few weeks ago, and they had those little kids, the, the pages, walking around. And they look like soldiers. They're not allowed to c turn in a curve. They have to turn and do a 90 degree you know, quick turn. And, and they're tuxedos. Yeah, and I think it goes back to what I was saying about loose language. Uh, I think we're too far on one side. And I think we should make government seem more fun and, and human and a little organic and natural. Your thoughts on the brand quote? Uh, well, I think that you can do things to increase voter turnout, like change the electoral system and move it five or ten percentage points so you can compel people to vote. But at some point, you have to ask people, are there things which you should do regardless of the outcome? Are there some things in life which are a duty uh, and uh, uh, for which we don't have to show you that it's somehow it's, a, it's that the outcome is going to change or that, or, or that your one vote is going to win an election to make you come and, come and vote? And I think voting may be one of those things which you ought to do regardless of whether you like the options in front of you, regardless of whether you think that your vote is going to you know, have a marginal uh, uh, difference on the outcome. There so are make some, it mandatory like the Aussies? I'm not, no, I'm not saying make it mandatory, but I'm saying when people say, when people come up with any number of excuses for why they don't vote, mm. you should begin the conversation by saying, do you think you have a duty to vote? Right? And if they say they don't have a duty, fine, then we can talk about how they should vote. But we should remind people that there are some actions which are moral and they're moral in the sense that in doing them is the right thing regardless of the, of the outcome. Categorical imperatives is another way of putting it. So, I mean, my view is that th there's a lot right about what Russell Brand says for sure, and there's a lot of wisdom in it. But, when, but a lot of the reasons people give us for not wanting to vote or not voting are just justifications for why they are, in, you know, are, are not engaging in the social action. Just the same way that people who uh, uh, engage in antisocial behavior can give you a reason for why. I litter because everyone litters. Mm -hmm. I don't pay my transit fare because nobody pays their transit fare. A good bit of it is that stuff, not genuine uh, principled disillusionment. Samara has, of course, for many years now, been trying to get more active citizen engagement. Do you want to make voting mandatory? Um, I, I personally don't support that position because I think it takes the system, so to speak, and the actors within it off the hook. Um, you know, if you ultimately say a successful democracy is everybody votes, then you know, I guess that would be as blunt a response. My personal view, though, is that that uh, that doesn't encourage us to actually address the reasons why people don't vote. You want a system in a where everybody and wants to vote. Way. Well, that's what I would I would love. <laughs> I mean, hmm. I know I'm not naive. That's going to take a long time to get there, but I'm not sure a blunt, uh, forced mechanism is the answer. Hmm. We've got just a couple of minutes left here, and we started the program talking about this wonderful 1921 document that. Dave uncovered, uh, showing some of the uh, good housekeeping seal of approval rules for politicians in how they ought to conduct themselves. And it feels, since we're on the topic of what duty the electorate has in participating in their democracy, it feels right that we should conclude with some of the rules that um, citizens ought to have and ought to be governed by. Dave, do you want to do the honors? you want to start out by reading one that you particularly like? Um, sure. I'll, I'll, st I'll start with the, uh, the last one. <laughs> These guys had a great <laughs> sense of humor. They were called the Bureau of Municipal <laughs> Research. In 1921, <clears throat> I will be a citizen, not a parasite or mollusk, nor a piece of blotting paper. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like good advice. I think so. <laughs> OK. Uh, Allison, you got something there you like? To be a good citizen in 1921 and maybe for today as well? Well, number one is a nice one because it reminds us that we actually do have a voice that we can exercise any time. And so we, it's, it says that it, during 1921, maybe we could say 2014, um, I will occasionally drop a note of uh, commendation, commiseration, or condemn, com Demnation to my representatives and counselor on the Board of Education. So what that is really saying is that I'm going to praise when things are worth praising and I'm going to articulate an alternative when it's required. Seems and like a sweet that idea. That would be a nice little thing to 20 do. 20 seconds for Peter, 20 for Royson. That was my favorite, but I, uh, my second is I will not regard the interests of my, of my ward above the interests of my city and will not bring pressure on aldermen or trustees to secure special treatment for my ward or locality which would not be a benefit to the city as a whole. Boy, could never get elected on that platform today. <laughs> That's a good idea, though. Royson? Uh, number seven, I will not condone the browbeating or contemptuous treatment of civic officials. 
That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, we've I seen, should follow that, right? We've seen quite a bit of both, actually, <laughs> at City Hall these days. <laughs> Folks, thanks for coming in tonight and helping us out with this very interesting discussion from Peter Lowen, the Assistant Professor of Political Science at UTM. Royce and James, the City Affairs columnist at the Toronto Star. Alison Lote, the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Samara. Dave Meslin, whose latest, Local Motion, The Art of Civic Engagement in Toronto, is uh, where? What, better bookstores everywhere or online or that, the new stand or whatever they say. Thanks so much, guys. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.